Hi everyone, this is Kevin Wagner, the Keto Advocate. In January of 2016, I had the privilege to sit down and chat with Dr. Zhang Ro at the first annual conference on nutritional ketosis and metabolic therapeutics held in Tampa, Florida. Let's see what Dr. Ro had to say. I'm Dr. Zhang Ro, I'm a professor of pediatrics, uh, clinical neurosciences, physiology and pharmacology at the University of Calgary and also uh, at the Alberta Children's Hospital where I'm uh, chief of uh, pediatric neurology. Could you tell us about the topic you'll be speaking about here at the conference? At the conference I'm going to be talking about the broad uh, neuroprotective disease modifying potential of ketogenic therapies for not just epilepsy but for other neurological disorders. And in particular, uh, since uh, many of the topics that have been sort of published in the literature recently will be uh, touched upon by uh, other speakers in this meeting, uh, I'm going to focus on uh, part of our research program that emphasizes metabolic and ketogenic therapies for autism spectrum disorder. With respect to uh, uh, mechanisms of the diet uh, relative to epilepsy, We've been focusing on a target within the mitochondria, and this is a multi-protein complex, complex known as the uh, mitochondrial permeability transition pore. And so we published a paper earlier last year showing that ketone bodies actually inhibited the MPT and in so doing provided an anti-seizure effect. Uh, so in extending those studies, we're trying to now dissect the specific mechanisms by which these ketone bodies uh, you know, actually produce uh, anti-seizure uh, effects, and so we're having a huge part of our laboratory focus on that. Um, another part of our lab is focused on uh, autism spectrum disorder, and so we have a couple rodent models that we've been working with over the last several years, and we've already published and shown that uh, a ketogenic diet can actually improve core behaviors in these uh, models, and so uh, our efforts now are to try to dissect again the mechanisms by which the diet makes these uh, you know, effects occur. Well, with regard to uh, sort of nutritional ketosis and metabolic therapies, kind of broadly speaking, um, I think a lot of people have been looking at various neurological disorders, um, and the primary ones being epilepsy brain cancer, uh, you know, Alzheimer's, cognition, things of that nature. Uh, I think uh, the truth is, the, while the basic science is you know, interesting and sometimes compelling, uh, at the end of the day, we need to do the definitive clinical studies to know whether these approaches have benefits in patients. So I think the shift or the emphasis uh, in terms of doing proper clinical studies really should come out as a priority in the near term, otherwise uh, the basic science will be left to be just that, basic science and interesting for basic science sake, but not clinically relevant. So that's an interesting question because for many years uh, uh, autism researchers as well as families with members affected with autism have long believed that the, the gut uh, has an important role to play. So whether it's an infection or some sort of uh, instability uh, of the so-called microbiome, right? Uh, they felt that that was an etiologic factor in terms of the development of autism. So you know, so it makes some sense that well, you know, diet would influence the microbiome. The diet would also influence gut function, and so these things have, have been coming more and more together. And so I think uh, the reality is that uh, there is now growing emphasis on establishing links between metabolism, diet, nutrition, uh, the microbiome, and inflammation, which is a very important component of that, right? So in the past, uh, autism etiologies were sort of, uh, you know, put into lists with on uh, different buckets. And now we're seeing many things come together and say, well, you know, these things do relate to each other in, in ways that we might not have appreciated earlier. So I think the future emphasis on autism is going to be understanding the biology of all these links. But importantly, from my perspective, what's really missing uh, for the field uh, is a concerted effort in terms of therapeutics to address core symptomatology of autism. So while we have treatments that may or may not work for comorbid problems such as epilepsy, 
you know, uh, you know, sleep disturbances, et cetera, uh, we don't really have effective treatments that get at the core symptomatology, the impaired socialization, the restricted motor behaviors and stereotypies, or the communication deficits that can be sometimes so disabling to many patients and a and huge burden for families and, and to society. Yeah, so as everyone appreciates more and more that the ketogenic diet was actually first uh, developed in the early 1920s uh, for patients with medically intractable epilepsy. And while it remained dormant for decades until the mid-1990s, uh, really the emphasis has always been on epilepsy. And when scientists began to try to understand, well, how does the diet work to control seizures, um, they uncovered some mechanisms and findings that potentially would be relevant to other neurological diseases. So, you know, I'll give you one example. Uh, the ketogenic diet is neuroprotective. It uh, protects brain cells from death or damage. And so while many neurologic diseases are associated with neuronal injury or death, uh, it makes some sense that if you had a readily available therapy that might mitigate or lessen the neuronal injury or death, that might actually help in the disease process. So this very simple kind of connection really leads us to think that maybe ketogenic or dietary meta metabolism-based therapies would be useful for a broad range of disorders that have at its core uh, a, either neurodegeneration of some sort or a progression uh, that impacts cellular viability. And so that's really sort of the scientific uh, thought behind this. As it turns out, you know, if you look at the current literature, uh, that sort of simple connection is now proving to be more and more valid with increasing number of studies that are showing that dietary approaches can actually provide uh, neuroprotection. Now, whether it will ultimately provide disease modification uh, is still yet to be firmly ascertained, uh, but that is the next step uh, in this process. Now, ketones have long been understood uh, for, you know, nearly a century, actually, to be important substrates for energy, right? So if you can't use glucose as your fuel, ketones are an alternate source of fuel, particularly during early stages of, you know, brain development. So the idea came about that ketones provide energy, they're more efficient, they provide more ATP than glucose alone because it goes through oxidative metabolism. Uh, the other comp... Uh, sort of role that ketones play are they provide the carbon skeleton for development, right? So that was the historical kind of notion. Uh, fast forward to just within the last three to five years, uh, ketones have now been shown to have a sort of multiple or pleiotropic role in regulation of physiologic processes. Uh, it, it's actually affecting inflammation. It's affecting mitochondrial function in a way that is not just, you know, producing energy molecules. It's, it's modulating uh, proteins and enzymes in a way that uh, have epigenetic changes. So uh, one of the key findings in the last three years was the observation that beta-hydroxybutyrate, one of the major ketone bodies, is a histone deacetylase inhibitor, a broad one at that, at clinically relevant concentrations. So you can imagine that ketosis or, you know, an organism's exposure to ketone bodies could have very dramatic effects in terms of uh, normal physiology, biochemistry, and function. And if an individual has a neurologic disease, then uh, these anti-inflammatory, epigenetic, metabolic, and bioenergetic changes would actually produce, uh, you know, a, uh, an improvement in symptomatology, not just uh, sort of uh, salvaging cells from dying. Well, let's first talk about the ketogenic diet. So there are many things that happen, uh, glucose restriction, fatty acids that go up, polyunsaturated fatty acids, for example, there's ketosis that occurs, and there's a whole host of other parallel and potentially synergistic mechanisms induced by the ketogenic diet. Many of those things do wind up having ultimately neuroprotective properties, anti-inflammatory properties, and they mitigate some of the key processes that we understand today as causing you know, cell death and damage, right? If we kind of drill down on the ketones themselves, um, ketones have been shown to be antioxidant. They enhance bioenergetic reserve. Uh, 
Uh, I indicated earlier that, they, that through peripheral mechanisms, it has an anti-inflammatory effect as well. Uh, and, and, I, and, and, and I think the reality is that with the epigenetic changes that it induces, that it also can afford protective uh, effects in addition to that I just described. With respect to the ketogenic diet, I would say that there are so many parallel and intersecting and potentially synergistic mechanisms that you can't really parse out an individual substrate or target that you know, may be the key or fundamental element. I think a lot of these things are accrued simultaneously. And so if you have a sufficient number of these things affected in the right direction or the right way, then you'll derive a benefit uh, clinically or otherwise. Uh, so I, in, in, in terms of the ketogenic diet with glucose lowering or ketosis or ketone elevating, uh, they're very uh, connected. They're not separate. One can induce the other and vice versa in many ways. Uh, so I think both are important is really the bottom line answer to your question. And, and I think that, uh, you know, if you ask the question another way, uh, would, you know, elevating ketones in light of normal glucose still have a benefit? And conversely, would normal ketones with a lowering glucose have a similar benefit? I think there are, there are incremental benefits that can be achieved, uh, but I think the best overall bang for your buck is really going to be to have all of the proper changes that we've talked about. Yeah. Yes, with high-fat diets, there's always that concern about long-term effects on cardiovascular health and lipid profiles and that nature. Um, the diet is not without side effects, uh, but it can be safely administered with the, an appropriately trained and experienced team. I think the perspective that I would take on this is, A, we don't have the answers long term for that because most of these diets are actually given to young infants and children, and uh, the long term follow-up studies have not been done in terms of long health risk right, over decades. Um, sure, there are concerns, and, and I think that you have to kind of take that in the context of what are you trying to treat with the diet? If it's a medically refractory epilepsy that you can't treat any other way and it elevates the risk of sudden and unexpected death, well then you sort of have to kind of weigh the pros and cons there, right? Each individual case has to be considered separately and I think it's really incumbent upon the healthcare professionals and the team to decide, you know, what side effects are acceptable or normal are less than what would be expected otherwise by not treating. Uh, and so it is complicated, but I, but I think in, in the end, uh, most practitioners in the ketogenic diet feel for epilepsy anyway, uh, feel that uh, the benefits far outweigh the potential negatives. And therefore, that's why it's increasing in popularity. That's why there are ketogenic diet centers all over the world that are popping up. And, and even in resource limited countries, uh, it's providing an alternative option when drugs are not available because because they're too expensive. So uh, both laboratory investigators as well as clinical researchers have actually shown that the ketogenic diet does in fact raise certain polyunsaturated fatty acids. Uh, when you ask the question, what does that mean and what are the consequences of that? Well, polyunsaturated fatty acids are neuroprotective. They also affect the ion channels and receptors that can modulate activity of cells, like in the heart as well as in the, in the brain. And so while we don't really know quite yet how they go through the, to the brain, what they do specifically with brain targets in vivo, we have a lot more evidence in vitro, basically in a dish, as to what they do. And so I think that's a very important area to study. And I think there's also other elements of uh, unsaturated fatty acids, such as the omega-3s and 6s, the ratios of the 6s and the 3s, you know, which is better, which is worse. Um, those things still have to be sort of ascertained. But I think, uh, you know, if you look at sort of uh, the overall health of populations that eat diets that are rich in polyunsaturated fatty acids, like the Mediterranean diet, for example, uh, you know, they have uh, less in the way of long-term health problems, cardiovascular, stroke, et cetera, diabetes. Uh, and, uh, and there's a scientific reason for that, I think, in many ways.
I think um, the way to look at BDNF uh, as a neurotrophin, as a brain-derived neurotrophic factor, uh, is that, you know, depending on how much you have, you know, a little may be necessary, a little more may be beneficial under certain circumstances, but having too much may be damaging, right? It's kind of like water. You need water to survive, but you can drown if you have too much of it, right? So it is a matter of relative amount and under what kind of circumstances. The same thing occurs with regard to uh, free radicals. You know, we always think of, you know, reactive oxygen species or ROS or free radicals as being always damaging. But actually at a low concentration and low levels throughout the body, they're an important signaling molecule. They're required for normal physiology. And if you don't have enough of it, then you're not going to function normally. So that, I think that's really the way to look at the, these important uh, molecules. With regard to epilepsy, you know, if there's, you know, aberrant uh, expression or activity of things like BDNF and its receptor, uh, track B receptor, um, you, you can have approaches both pharmacologically as well as dietary that could normalize. And I think one of the key things that we're beginning to appreciate with uh, ketogenic diet or, or metabolism-based research is the following. Uh, depending on the disease state, uh, certain things will go up, certain things will go down, right? And, you know, it's not always a linear thing where we try to inhibit uh, if, if things are apparently overexpressed. If it's underexpressed, then we need to kind of restore balance. And I think that what, what uh, my, my view of the, one of the large-scale reasons why ketogenic diet might be useful for many different disorders is it has a homeostatic effect. It tends to kind of normalize aberrant gene expression, uh, uh, activity of certain key proteins and enzymes, uh, signaling molecules, et cetera, it, it kind of restores that balance. And I look at it from the, for a simplistic standpoint of, you know, if cells require energy to function and you have problems in energy production or even overproduction and utilization, uh, then restoring balance, energetically speaking, will allow the cell to function more normally. It's kind of like a city on an electrical grid with power stations that are distributed. The power stations are the mitochondria, right? You know, how does a city function? Well, you need to have the connections, but you also need to have energy to make everything work. If you have a loss of energy through mitochondrial dysfunction or you know, other problems that are maldistributed in the in energy network, you're not gonna have a functional homeostatic city. And so this is really sort of a generic concept that I'd like to advance.